Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, the Seashell Hospital Foundation. I'm uh, very excited to be here because there's nothing more that I like to talk about than science. Um, and, and today I want to share a little bit of some information um, from a very cell biology perspective because technically I studied worm gonads for seven years, um, which was a fantastic way to spend your seven years of your life. Um, but I come from a genetics and cell biology background. And so when we start talking about the process of aging, um, we need to start talking about it as a disease of cellular dysfunction. And this whole idea, this whole, there's a big paradigm shift happening in science right now about this idea that, you know what, aging is not an inevitable condition that we just are plodding towards. That in fact, it is potentially a preventable disease. Now, that sounds crazy, um, because we all have felt the effects of aging at, at any point past basically 20 years old, because we start to age at 20. And it starts to accrue in our bodies, and we just assume that that is just fate. But science is saying, look, that's not true. That In fact, there's quite a few organisms, and we can look at a variety of different organisms, that don't age. That what we see from a cellular perspective is they show negligible senescence, which means that their cells don't show the hallmarks of aging. What are those kinds of things? These guys don't get cancer. This is one of my favorite things on the planet. Um, this is the naked mole rat. And, um, and uh, they're, they're really amazing from a science perspective because they're a rodent that's about the size of, sort of in between a rat and a, and a mouse. Um, and an average sort of dormouse would live about two years. And they start to show signs of aging. Mice get arthritis, mice get Alzheimer's. We know these things, we can test these things. The naked mole rat, its very similar kind of evolutionary cousin, lives to 30 years. It lives 15 times longer than some very, very similar organism on the planet. We've got things like the rough-eyed rockfish that can live up to 105 years long, old. This is um, oh, the uh, old bristle pine. And this, is, right, this particular tree is 4,715 years old. So these, there are things on the planet that can live a very, very long time, and most importantly, don't show the hallmarks of aging. So the, the best question, this is an Ulm, this guy lives to be about 100, um, and they're a little sort of, uh, they're similar to an axolotl, if you've seen those. Uh, they're sort of marine organisms. What we see by saying is, well, what do they die from? It's the biggest question I say, they don't age. Well, what do they die from? Because we just think we die of old age. They die of predation, of disaster, of just things that, that would we account to being hit by a bus, right? But they don't actually show um, defects in cognition as they age, which we can test in animals, not in a tree, but we can test in other things. Um, and so, the, so then the question is, well, how do they do it? Can't we learn from these creatures can't we look at their cells and study their DNA and, and look at their biology to say, can't we do that too? We are all under the same umbrella of nature. We all share this very similar gene structures and certainly with the naked mole rat, we have a lot of genetic similarity to them. Um, just don't quite look like that. <laughs> we're, we're quite similar. But, but we, we do have tools in our, in our genes, in our bodies, in our cells they can help us have negligible senescence, which is basically not aging. I, although, when you start looking at all of these organisms that show what's called negligible senescence, you realize you might be a trade-off between ugly and old? <laughs> it's kind of hard. I don't know. But we certainly, of course, humans, we, we most definitely age. Um, and, but now what we're saying is, well, OK, it's not inevitable, at least biologically. So the question is, well, why do we age? What is the evolutionary significance of it? Is, the, is it part of the plan? Um, is it something that's evolved with our, our system and our, 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 what's called our life history traits in evolutionary biology? And so researchers have been looking at this and they said, well, hmm, maybe we age to cull the population. Maybe after, you know, in, in, at least in humans, the females are past their reproductive years, and then it's okay if they die off. Once you hit menopause, you're not useful anymore. That was a legitimate scientific theory. Um, it's been debunked, grandmas out there, don't worry. It's been thoroughly debunked. Um, in fact, they found that the grandmother effect, uh, did you know there's only three species on the planet that show menopause? One is a killer whale, 
And somehow they did this study where they looked at menopause in killer whales, um, and in, in uh, actually right off the coast here. And they found that um, a, a matriarch, a post-reproductive female in the pod, made the pod much, much more successful in their, in their genetic contributions to the population. So in fact, grandmas are of ultimate importance. <laughs> Very important uh, to the success of our species. But, but so then, okay, well, we can throw that theory out. Well, then what is it? And, and there maybe is a theory as to why you know, humans and most species on the planet do show signs of aging, um, in that because it's really hard from an evolutionary perspective to select for traits after you're done reproducing. Selecting for old age is very difficult because if you're done reproducing, then you can't have any more children to pass on that great trait of that you can live to be 150. But that's, so that's probably it. It's called the, the selection shadow. It just, it's just hard to evolutionary select for. How did the naked mole rat and the ulm and the, and the bristlecone pine do it? We don't know yet, but again, we're trying to learn from them. So what is aging at the level of the cell? We know that cancer is a disease of aging. As you get older, your, your um, risk of cancer increases, simply because you, we start to just accrue damage. Our bodies do, as, as an aging species, our cells slow down in their efficiency. And there is one argument for the case of aging as a way to prevent cancer. So as you age, um, as we are all experiencing right now, we don't re replenish our cells as quickly. We don't heal as fast. We don't um, quite have the same cellular repair pathways working as well. Because it turns out that if we keep our bodies working great um, at, at 20 years old, as, and we repair and we replace, and our stem cells are, are, are going through all their, their business, we predispose ourselves to cancer. So there is an argument to say that, look, we've basically we age to not get cancer, but aging is, a, cancer is a cellular disease. So I'll talk a little bit about this idea of the mitochondrial damage. This is a main, a very, very key player in our cellular basis of aging. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. But we also have um, these, what we see is extracellular matrix stiffening, that's what you get wrinkles from. Extracellular aggregates, that's where you get Alzheimer's and Parkinson's um, and, um, and, and to a certain extent, Huntington's, although it's, that's generally hereditary. And, and intracellular aggregates. If you are curious about, and if you've ever read anything about Alzheimer's, then you know about tau, you know about beta amyloid. Um, these are things that are just diseases of aging because the argument is, in a species that ages, our cells just slow down. We just don't get, we're not as good at repairing mutations as we used to be. We're not as good at cleaning up, just housekeeping. And, and the housekeeping of getting rid of the stuff that doesn't work anymore in our cells, well, it turns out that if you don't housekeep, then you end up as a hoarder. Then you end up with broken stuff piled up in your house. And that's what's happening to our cells. And that just stops you from being able to do healthy things. And in that case, that causes particularly Alzheimer's, certain cancers, not all of them, um, and Parkinson's being major uh, cognitive aging. So the mitochondria. Mitochondria are really key players in this aging cascade. So mitochondria, I like to call them sort of the, 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 your furnace room in your house, and your cell is a house, and your mitochondria is your furnace room. It's where you get all of your energy and actually most of your heat from. So our mitochondria are little compartments, little rooms in, this, in the cell. Every cell has them. Um, and what they do is they give us energy. We take in oxygen, because we breathe. We take in oxygen, we breathe. We, the mitochondria use that oxygen and make energy that allows us to do our movements. And it turns out, when people ask me, okay, well, well then what causes aging? I'm like, well, living causes aging. So it's kind, of, it's kind of a hard answer. But breathing causes aging. The more you breathe, the more likely you are to die of old age, <laughs> which is good. Um, no, but the reason is, the reason for that is that the oxygen that you, we take in, oxygen, this is kind of something my, I know my students, I still teach at university, they kind of go, wait, oxygen's bad? Oxygen is incredibly reactive and causes cancer. 
We know that, and causes aging, which is the whole reason why a lot of our diet these days are focused on green leafy vegetables, you know, uh, uh, nice dark rich berries, because they're full of antioxidants. Well then, if they're antioxidants, they're anti, they're against the oxidants. What are the oxidants? They come from the mitochondria. They come from the fact that we need energy, needless to say. Um, we need energy to move our bodies and, and, and just live. And so what happens is when we, our mitochondria are working well, they are still generating some toxic waste. It's just part of biology, is that every sort of cellular reaction often has a little bit of toxic waste. So there's some toxic waste that builds up. That damages our cells. So it's the oxygen and what's called the reactive oxygen species, or ROSs, which is right down here. I realize this is a bit of an intimidating cell biology figure. But, uh, but what happens is that oxygen comes in, our, our mitochondria use oxygen. We need, clearly need oxygen. If you don't think you need oxygen, hold your breath. Okay? We need oxygen in our bodies, but we've done this trade-off in evolution to say, oxygen damages my cells, okay, but it's really efficient at, at making energy for us, so we'll take it. So what happens is, as you age, you have accumulated these reactive oxygen species, these toxic byproducts, and they cause damage to our cells. One particular thing is they cause damage to our DNA. And when we damage our DNA, when we induce mutations, then what that does is it slows our progress down. It slows how healthy we are. Because we have to fix the DNA, and then we have to make, try and fix it correctly, and we might screw up, and that predisposes us to cancer. So we have all of these things that are all linked into this one little compartment in our bodies called the mitochondria that generates reactive oxygen species. And if your cell gets too much damage, it's really cool, because if your cell can sense that, you know what? Mm, I can't fix this, I've got too many mutations, too many of my, uh, of my stuff in the cell has been damaged because of these chemical reactions and these toxic wastes, our cells have the ability to kill themselves. They go through something called uh, programmed cell death or apoptosis. And as we accumulate damage, we, the, some of the cells have to die off because there's too damage to fix, but that accelerates aging because we're losing cells. And so then we have problems. We, we have a, a, a less of effective digestive lining, so we end up with digestive problems later in life. We don't digest things as well. We don't absorb nutrients as well. Um, we have problems replacing our skin cells. So we start to get wrinkles, and we start to get thinning skin. We lose our hair. Those kinds of things all have to do with the fact that we have accumulated damage in our life. Of, of course, this just goes with the territory of being alive. And of course, we can also speed up the damage we do to our bodies with smoking, with lack of exercise, with sitting, and I'll, and I'll talk about those in a bit. So what we find is that DNA damage, in particular, is one of the hardest things to fix in our body. Okay? And so anything that damages our DNA, which we know, UV light, really potent DNA-damaging mutagen, which is why tanning causes cancer, Breathing causes cancer, so uh, just kind of accept it at some point. Um, but because uh, these oxygen molecules cause cancer. So there is an argument, again, this sort of why do we age? It might be that we age to prevent cancer. So because we haven't figured out how to prevent cancer biologically, maybe aging is just a way to avoid, you know, we, we kind of can thin our cells, thin our skin, thin our digestive lining, um, lose a bit of hair in order to avoid getting cancer. So that's starting to sound like a decent trade-off. So there are, so the question is, how do you study aging? You know, it, it's, it's really easy to sort of look at everyone and say, well, we age. But how do you study it scientifically? How do you find the genes responsible? How do you find the, the real things? We, we do twin studies. So we take identical twins, um, often ones that are often reared apart, and, or a twin that smokes versus a twin that doesn't, and look at how fast they age. What are their propensity towards arthritis, cardiovascular disease, um, all those kinds of things, and as well as, as brain diseases. And we know, everyone knows, smoking causes uh, premature aging. But we can also move to very severe conditions. 
And we learn a lot in science, in genetics, from when things go really wrong. Um, this is Devin Scullion. He is uh, from Hamilton, Ontario. He just died last October. Um, he was 21 years old. So he has a condition that's very rare. There's currently only two, well, there were three. Now there are two other um, individuals in Canada with this disease, and they clearly exhibit premature aging. It's a, a condition called progeria. And so from a genetics perspective, we go, what's causing this? Is this a very severe form of what's causing mild aging in us? And so we look at these kinds of diseases, um, and, and again, they're, they're rare enough, thankfully, that they're hard to study, but they become really important. There's also another uh, disease of aging. Um, this is uh, obviously a, a Japanese individual um, with Werner syndrome. And so this is her at 15. This is 48. That's an unbelievable rapid aging process. And, and what's interesting is that this was found to be a defect in only one gene. We have about 30,000 genes in an average, in, in a human, um, and that's one of them, and that causes that syndrome. So that's become a very interesting avenue to sit there and say, well, what does this gene do? If this is just one gene that causes very, very sped up, you know, massive premature aging, is that, a tar is that a, maybe a potential therapeutic target? If it, when this gene is not working, you get severe aging, can we just turn it up in us so that we avoid aging? And that's the kind of thing that, that the way we study aging. So it turns out for this individual that had Werner syndrome, she, was a, a, she had a mutation in a gene for something called telomerase. Very important part of the aging cascade. So we've got the mitochondria on one side, we've got telomeres, and I'll talk about what those are. So every single cell in our body also has long chunks of DNA. We have about two meters of DNA in every cell, divided into about to 46 chunks. And, and at the ends of every long stretch of DNA, we have, at the very end, there's these sections of DNA we've just called telomeres. The reason why they're important is because this is one of the most common, I would say not necessarily the most accurate theories of aging, but part of the story. And that is that every time we divide our cells, so if our, if our DNA is this long, every time as we get older, we just get, get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter for about 300 times, 300 cell divisions, and then our bodies go, no. Nah! No, you're, you, this DNA you can be lost. This stuff, no, you've got to die. You have to go through this apoptosis. So the idea was, well, we have this predetermined 300 cell divisions for each cell type in our body. And then all, as soon as you hit 300-ish, not exactly finite, um, then all of a sudden your cells go, nope, can't do this anymore. No more replications. You have to, that cell, you have to kill yourself. And so... There's this sort of limited cell divisions that each inherent, each cell in our body has. And then as soon as we hit that limit, we start to see the signs of aging. Well, it turns out that in stem cell populations and in babies, and, and, um, and also um, babies in the womb, they have an enzyme. They have an enzyme in our stem cell populations that can make our chromosomes longer. So then our stem cell populations don't age. By the very definition, if you read uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, you know that, right? Her HeLa cells were so important because they did not age. If you take a regular human cell, put it in culture and grow it, it divides about 300 times and gone, dies. But these ones, if they have telomerase, they can keep that, they don't lose that DNA, and then they can live technically forever. So maybe this is a secret. Maybe this is a secret to curing aging. Maybe all we need to do is just dial up telomerase, where that woman had Werner syndrome, had it dialed down, and she prematurely aged. Maybe in us, we just need to turn it up. Sounds great. The internet is abound. You can buy it online. Don't. <laughs> um, 
but you, you can buy telomerase these days. The problem is, the, you know the other place where telomerase is really active? Stem cells, babies, and cancer cells. So if you take telomerase, this was a great idea, until they found out that really you're basically just giving a leg up to cancer. So how do we not age well, and not get cancer? And that's really the race. We start talking about this idea of curing aging. We have to, first of all, figure out how to age without getting cancer. That's the number one. Cancer is a disease of aging. Now, there's a guy, there's quite a few now. Uh, he's the, uh, uh, the Aubrey de Grey. Um, he is the guy who has a pie in the sky vision of curing aging, curing it, not preventing, and, and, and this, this, what's really important about this is if we cure the physical manifestations of aging, we're not just increasing lifespan, we're increasing health span, we're in increasing youth span, right? And that's the amazing, of course, holy grail. So I might point out, he's only 54. He looks old to me. And so, anyways, he's, a, he's an absolute brilliant guy. I've, I've interviewed him before. Um, he has started this foundation called the SENS Research Foundation, the Strategies for Engineered Neglig Negligible Senescence. And his argument, and, and you know what? The thing is, it's scientifically fair. This is from a cell biology perspective. I'm looking at this going, Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, okay, we can, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we can do that. All we have to do is take conditions and take strategies and take medical interventions that we know already exist and we use for anti-cancer therapies and those kinds of things and just kind of repurpose them. So this is, this is Aubrey de Grey's vision. He says, look, this is what happens when you age. You get cell loss, you get cancer, you get this mitochondrial damage, which is causing a lot of the cell loss. You get death-resistant cells, AKA cancer. You get extra ma cellular matrix stiffening. I haven't talked about that. Extracellular aggregates and intracellular aggregates, that's cognitive decline. And he's going, okay, here is this big picture. Let's look at aging as a cellular disease. It's not about one pill. It's not ever going to be one pill. Aging is a very complex cellular process that we know species on the planet have solved. And so what this idea is saying, look, let's do what we already do in all kinds of different mouse models and, and certainly human trials, and let's look at it. Let's, if, you, if you're losing too many cells, add some stem cells. We've got all kinds of incredible stem cell research happening. So if your problem is that, that your digestive lining is thinned and you're getting more, uh, in, uh, more nutritional sensitivities and you're not, in, you're not absorbing those nutrients, replace those cells. <coughs> Thicken that digestive lining a little bit so you're not as sensitive to heartburn and, and, and acid damage. If the problem with cancer is inhibit telomerase, but add more fresh new cells back. So there is, look, there's no, they're not gonna stand up here and say this is five years away. This is a generation away. This is, this is grandkids might experience something along the lines of really medical intervention that's going to elongate their health span that starts early. And, and so we see, okay, well, we know that, for instance, the immune system is really good at clearing out dead cells, at clearing out diseased tissue. So let's, let's maybe boost that somehow. Get that to do it. And there's, that's why there's a vaccine now um, in trial for Alzheimer's basically getting you the, uh, the immune system to do the dirty work, to go in and clear out all that junk that's piling up in your, in your brains. So the SENS Research Foundation, as well as others, and, and I, I'm, I'm neglecting to talk about people like Nir Barzilai and, and others that are really sane. I want to point this out. This is not a crazy idea that we can cure aging. It sounds totally bananas, um, but the idea and the vision is, is that you go in, probably starting about 25, because again, aging really starts at 20. 25, maybe once a decade, you go to, for a physical, because for like when you're 20s, you go for a physical about once every 10 years. Um, and, and then you go get an infusion, a cocktail, 
um, of probably stem cells, um, some anti-cancer therapies, and maybe a little bit of sort of immune boosters. But then it changes as you get older and, and, and as you progress, as your problems get, become a little bit different, and you try and limit the amount of cellular aging in your bodies. So, do we have clear targets? And this sounds very pie in the sky, wishy-washy. It's telomerase, sort of. We do, um, and there are some really incredible research that's happening, of course, in worms. Um, this is the worm that I studied, and, uh, and these are the gonads. I'm not going to talk about those, though, um, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, so this is a little tiny round worm. It's called Cenorhabitus elegans, and it's about a millimeter long. It lives in your garden. Uh, you just can't see it. And it's great for research for lots of ways, um, but there was a researcher at the University of Wisconsin at Madison who realized, just kind of accidentally, realized that she was studying this other pathway, this other um, sort of uh, trait in these worms, that some of these mutant worms that she had were living twice as long as others. Worms exhibit cellular aging, we can see it, um, and they weren't. She uh, sort of had just accidentally stumbled upon a very simple organism that we know a lot about that all of a sudden didn't age. So then, okay, well, let, let's, what is it? And it turns out one a very, very, very important process in the whole aging cascade is the insulin pathway. If anyone who is, has diabetes or knows anyone with diabetes understands that diabetes makes you age very, very quickly. Because the sugar in your body, the lack of ability to process that, that sugar, the lack of the ability to store that sugar appropriately, really, really damages your cells. So, uh, Cynthia Kenyon, um, among others, discovered that in fact, if you eat less, you will live longer. If you restrict calories in a worm by 30%, and you can't, can put worms on a diet, they're okay, um, they live about 30% longer. They're like, wow, is this a one-to-one -one ratio? If I reduce my calories by 10%, will I live a health span 10% longer? Maybe. But it turns out that there's this common gene called the sirtuins, and the sirtuins are this sort of fasting response. And they are very important in cellular aging. Now, you guys have heard uh, red wine stops aging. Resveratrol, um, which is the active ingredient in red wine that we talk, talk about with longevity, um, uh, resveratrol enhances the sirtuins. Now, if you think you can just drink yourself to a longer life, um, you actually have to drink, in order to get the right dose of resveratrol from red wine, you have to drink 180 glasses a day. <laughs> So, not yet therapeutically possible. You can try, but I wouldn't recommend it. So, but this idea that the insulin pathway, the insulin pathway is really, really key when it comes to aging. Very, very important. And it's found mice, if you, re if you have mice that are calorically restricted, and, and in science, we joke that mice are furry humans. We really very much treat them as like we're treating on a clinical trial in humans, is how we treat the mice. Not that fair, but it works for most things. We can increase the lifespan of mice by about 10%, their relative health span by 10%, by reducing their caloric intake by 30%, which, let's, let's face it, is a pretty reasonable diet for most of us. Okay. Um, so, can it work in humans? Ah, the research is kind of out. Sounds great. I mean, it doesn't sound great. It sounds like you're on a diet for the rest of your life to hopefully live 10 years longer. I don't know. I mean, I just want to own it now. But this, so this idea of fasting, it, it, it hasn't... We know that the insulin pathway is important, but just like anything in aging, it's a multifactorial disease. We have to come at it with a bunch of things. Is fasting part of it? Is caloric restriction part of it? Absolutely. Um, but it's not the... Thankfully... <laughs> Thankfully, it's not the only answer. Hopefully, there's other answers than taking away, you know, our treats. But you can't have a science talk these days without bashing sugar. Um, and, uh, and it's true. So what happens with when you eat too much sugar, which I'm, like, absolutely 100% guilty of every day? 
Um, we know that sugar is the devil. We've got that message. That's, that's, fat's okay. Sugar's bad. Reverse everything. Change everything you know. Um, but what, the w- reason why sugar is bad is that we know very, very clearly. Um, and this is where we have to get a bit of vanity because one of the things that really we start to first notice aging, and I'm starting to notice, I'm 38. I don't physically feel that much different than I did when I was 28. Still playing basketball, still going for runs, but man, those wrinkles, that's what I care about right now, right? And, then, and, then, and, that's, and that's because I, I, I physically feel otherwise really good. Well, guess what? Sugar causes wrinkles. Like, sugar causes everything. I mean, it was wrinkles and everything. So it does absolutely 100%, we know, age the skin. Because when you eat too much sugar, you don't know where to put it. It spikes in your blood. You don't ever want to excrete it because we were evolved in a world where we didn't know where our next meal was coming from. We didn't have McDonald's around the corner. So every calorie that we ingested for for all of nature, you save. You make sure you're never going to get rid of that. So every single time you take in sugar, we just like stash it. Our bodies just go, okay, we're going to make fats. We're going to make longer sugars. We're going to store that in the liver, which is why you get um, a non-fatty liver disease. You, we're going to stash it here. We're going to stash it here. You know what? We're just going to throw it at the skin and just stick the sugars on a bunch of proteins in the skin. We're just trying to put it places. We don't know. We've run out of storage. So we start to just tack it on to proteins. And one of the more longer lived proteins in the body is collagen. And collagen, when it's glycated, it's called, um, causes wrinkles. So now, okay, well, let's talk about intervention. Now we know what causes it. Can we we fix it? Yes. Um, There's these anti-glycans that are now slowly being marketed and tried for anti-wrinkle cream. Um, But as as a next step as well, um, I should point out that uh, particularly the aminoguanidine and the um, paradoxamine, they're being also as a, as a possible intervention for diabetes. So there's more to it just than just vanity. Uh, aminoguanidine, it turns out, is toxic. Doesn't really help with aging if you're dying because of it. Pyridoxamine, um, those are um, th- those class of chemicals looking like they're going to be OK, potential interventions for diabetes and for wrinkles. Vitamin C, it looks like, is probably one of the best anti-glycans. It picks off the sugars that are sticking to your, to, to your uh, skin cells. And, um, and so look for that in anti-aging creams these days. So, I mean, so that we have to also switch, because you can't do an anti-aging talk without talking about diet. Um, also, I'm leaving Jody to talk about exercise. We'll have it covered. Um, so these are two monkeys that are the same age. They're both about 20, well, one's 26, one's 25 years old. And this was a long-term 26-year study um, on these rhesus monkeys. And which one looks older? Left, kind of, right? Because it looks like there's a macular degeneration. Um, this guy's older, but it's because like, you got the slouching, you got a dowager hump. Um, it's actually more gray um, for this kind of monkey, which is interesting. But these monkeys were raised on very, very, very different diets. Western diet, 3,000 calories, like the equivalent of 3,000 calories a day. Fried eggs, delicious, delicious, delicious. Um, and then this guy who had a calorie restricted diet, only 2,000 calories. That's what we should be eating, right? Um, not so delicious. Tofu, vegan sausage, French fries. <laughs> but no, but this is, so this is, um, and in fact, they were both given, just as a point of note, they were both given an apple a day. Just in case, just to ch- just check that theory. Um, but the diet obviously really, really, really matters when it comes to um, preventing aging. And again, I'm not talking about slowing aging. Eventually, it's going to be we're really going to be seriously talking about preventing aging from the very, very uh, start. But diet, you know, leafy greens, we all know that. So what's uh, what are good anti-aging foods? Um, avocado, power food, no doubt. Anything that dark. Okay, except for steak. <laughs> um, we know the fishes, the omega-3s, very good for preventing cognitive aging. That has been shown by a wide variety of trials. Um, so the omega-3s in particular. Um, garlic, 
Uh, obviously, you guys know very well about the berries here in BC. With the blackberries, you can just go, just keep eating them. They're delicious. And avocado. So I often get from this point a lot of questions about, okay, can I just like eat a burger and fries and then just take a bunch, bunch of supplements? Does that factor in? Um, and it's a bit of a different topic, and I can address this more one-on-one -on -one after, after the session, but almost all the supplements save potentially vitamin C and D, um, a little E sometimes, but, uh, but the vast majority of supplements that you buy at your pharmacy either don't work at all, or your body just doesn't absorb them in that way. We, we, in science, we call them, they're not bioactive. In that, yes, it's the right molecule, but it's not the right molecule in combination with, with the other, everything else that's in kale that would allow you to absorb that molecule. And we know this, for instance, if anyone's on iron supplementation, you know that you have to take iron with vitamin C. You don't absorb iron in any way from your diet or otherwise without vitamin C. And so, so that's what we call bioactive. So it's often in combination. So when it's just coming from supplementation, the oils tend to be okay, again, the sort of vitamin D, vitamin E, um, and, and certainly vitamin C, but watch in, in too high a dose. Um, and the, the, so those kinds of things, you can make up a little bit for not having a great diet, but supplements are, it's just eat your food, okay? That's all. So the other part of, science, uh, of the science of aging and is something that, um, there's two prongs to this particular photo. I actually took this picture. This is a woman who lives in um, the Dogon area of Mali. Mali's in West Africa. Um, from her house, it took about, about a 20 minute walk to the closest water source. She had a turtle living in her house. He was a tortoise, actually, huge tortoise. Um, and she was the, the, the widow of the chief of the village. And she thinks she's about 70. I don't know, but she looks fantastic for 70, personally, if you're walking up and down, you know, 20 minutes for water every day. And this comes to a little bit of genetics. Yes, if your parents live long, so will you, okay? If you maintain the same diet and exercise levels and don't get hit by a bus in the meantime. Um, yes, definitely. So there is some genetics to what we have now in science are calling the super agers. So if there's anyone in the audience who knows anyone over 100 years old, I want their DNA. <laughs> so many people want their bodies to science. Um, we're just going to start to call them. No, uh, there's doing a lot of now genomic studies on looking at what are the 100 year old, because usually by the time you've reached 100, um, you've probably aged pretty well all the way along. You probably had a decent 70s and a decent 80s um, as you, you know, you're deteriorating, no doubt. Um, but the, the genetics of super agers is going to be very, very, very important. So what they do is they just compare the genomes of anyone who lives over 100 and saying, what are they doing differently? What, what's in their genes that's doing differently? The other aspect to aging better um, is happiness. And most importantly, and I think um, Louise will talk a little bit about this, is loneliness. You age faster. One of the, one of the most obvious signs of an early death is loneliness. Um, and that because, in particular, uh, social stimulation, and that's anything, okay? And that's, that's FaceTiming with grandkids. That's any sort of social interaction and laughter uh, stimulates a reward response and dopamine um, release in your body and endorphins. And when you have endorphins and you're happy, it turns out your immune system's working better and that's clearing out cancer cells that are obviously always gonna form. And they're doing all these things that happiness and social interactions in combination with all the other things and diet and, and all those kinds of things are really important indicators of a long and healthy uh, health span. So, with, so I want to sort of present this package where aging is complicated from a cellular disease, but it's a disease and therefore potentially curable, just as cancer is a complicated cellular disease, but curable. It's a preventable condition that we are most re realistically accelerating because of our lifestyle decisions. And with, with backpedaling and improving our lifestyle, we can stave off aging. That is the absolute scientific 
um, evidence that's pointing towards. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to Jody, who's going to talk about movement. <laughs> <laughs>